Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and joining me for a conversation about Puppet Master 3, Toulon's Revenge, is the screenwriter himself, C. Courtney Joyner. Courtney, how are you? Hey, Heath. Well, th thank you so much for, uh, you know, letting me perch here at uh, Serial at Midnight. This is very nice, and uh, I'm kind of excited that that's actually my first 4K release. Is it really? This is the first Absolutely. one? Absolutely. Wow. And I got to say, it's a good one. Uh, people are going to want to know because I haven't done a full official review for this yet. Video quality is amazing on this. It's a huge step up from any previous edition. And uh, I'm happy to report that. So your first 4K is a real winner. It's a home run. Oh, good. Yes. I, I, I'm glad that uh, <laughs> it was that sort of, wow, boy, does this stink. Yeah. As soon as this was announced, I was like, oh, I know him. You know, I was got real excited. I was like, I have to talk to Courtney about this. I can't believe this movie was was in 91, a shot in what, 90? And then it was uh, released in 91, I believe. That was over 30 years ago. Yep. Do you remember much about it? Do, is it still kind of fresh for you? Oh, gosh, yes. I was, uh, Charlie Band, it was so weird. I ended up uh, doing that movie because I ran into Charlie kind of accidentally. Um, I went with a friend. I just done the movie class in 1999, and I had some things on TV and stuff. And uh, I went with an actor friend down to Full Moon because he was going there to audition. So I just tagged along. And as soon as I walked through the door, there was Charlie and his dad, you know, dude, what are you doing here? So, you know, that's Charlie, not Albert. And so uh, <laughs> we had a really nice reunion, a nice conversation. Charlie was shooting uh, Trancers 2 at that point. And produced by Dave Dakota. And Dave, of course, is an old, old friend. And so he asked me to come down on the set. And I did. And he said, how would you feel about being under contract to write three movies? And we was being uh, underwritten at that time by Paramount. So uh, the rates were pretty good. And I, I agreed. But I said, Charlie, I really want to direct a movie. So he said, OK, we'll build that in. And he did. So... Dr. Mordred, Puppet Master, and uh, Trancers 3, which I ended up directing. But that was, it was totally by happenstance, which, you know, you and I have talked about that film before, and it, it kind of was a series of very lucky happenstance over and over and over again uh, that informed that movie. Because uh, when Charlie said he wanted to do a prequel to the first film, I suddenly, I don't know, thank God I did, but I was all, you know, mired up with Alistair McLean in my head or something. And I just said, oh, this is great. This could be the Where Eagles Dare of Puppet Master movies. Nobody even knew. <laughs> and they're like, what does yeah. that mean? You know? And uh, so Dave Dakota would come over to my place and we'd sit there and we'd watch all these Pinewood, you know, Nazi movies. And the one David particularly liked was Night of the Generals with Peter O'Toole and Tom Courtney. And um, he really liked that movie. And that look, that Pinewood look, and everybody is always so turned out and all that stuff. And that was literally where we, we started from. That was what we wanted to kind of imitate and give that feeling uh, for. And also, we were going to shoot in Eastern Europe. It was going to be one of the first movies to be done in Romania. And then uh, that didn't happen. The, the deal fell through for one reason or another. And David and uh, our producer, John Schuweiler, of course, who'd worked with David a zillion times, uh, they went and they made the deal for us to shoot the movie at Universal. So, oh, my gosh, you could, couldn't do better than that. It was fantastic. What's funny about this, and to your point about, like, I mean, it's, it's circumstance, it's coincidence, it's the right place at the right time. In walks you, who is a walking encyclopedia of classic Hollywood, you know, esoterica, and then here's the, hey, prequel opportunity for Puppet Master, and then it's like, you're the guy that's supposed to write, like, that. it's made for you, and then to later end up shooting it at Universal, which again, perfect for you because you come from such you know the reverence for the universal monsters and you're in it like the the we call it the frankenstein village right like this right, like right. that's where you guys are at so it's this serendipity of just the, all these swirling circumstances that just ended up in this perfect storm of creativity go ahead and, and you know one of the things was and i think david talks about this on the disc 
is uh, they were shooting this movie called Newsies, and it was a musical, and they were on the New York Street, which backs up against uh, the quote unquote the Court of Miracles, which is really Frankenstein yeah. Village and all that stuff. And so, but they were shooting at night. So we were, you know, we would have to time out when were they shooting, when were they not shooting and everything else. And then we would jump in there. Of course, I was driving everybody crazy because I'm like, look, this was, uh, you know, Lionel Atwill and Frank Riker stood right here in Night Monster, you know. This kind this is of that, you guys. Did yeah. you? So hearing the story about the Newsies thing, there's Nazi flags all over the place. Did you guys have to take those down at the end of your shoot or put them back up or did they get to stay there? That's a good question. You know, I don't know. Uh, I think um, I imagine they probably had to come down, but we also shot there at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that first thing. Adolfo Bartoli did such a great job. And I love that very first shot because that shot, I'm like, oh my God, that's it. That is Sherlock Holmes and the secret weapon. It is literally almost the same framing of Roy William Neal, you know, with the car pulling up and stuff. I'm like, yeah, oh, this is so great. Only it's not, you know, Paul Fix and Cyril Delavanti or whoever it was getting out, you know, to threaten Basil Rathbone, but still. See, this is Richard what makes Rich you to threaten Ian Ambercrombie. That's right. Well, yep. as a screenwriter, what role, you know, screenwriters don't always have this very active involved process in the actual filming of the movie. You were on set a lot, right? You were present yes, for a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, David and I were such good pals that uh, I was there for all the casting. And uh, then when the shooting started, I, mean, I don't, don't intrude. I don't, you know, I know uh, I've done this enough to know about set protocol, but uh, I'd like to, I, it was fun to be there. And David sometimes would say, hey, what about this or what have you? I remember uh, Walter Gattel, uh came to me with, I have a problem with some of your dialogue. And I'm like, oh, what is it? Yeah, I was ready to do anything. I had indicated a, a street address on, I think, Lieberstrasse in Berlin. I think I'm pronouncing the name right. Anyway, Walter Gotell corrected me and said that number does not exist. It doesn't go up that high. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked if it was all right if he changed the number. And I said, oh, absolutely. You know, that was so cool, you know. So you get uh, deep, I, deeper research next time. You just exactly. Research. I mean, General Gogol actually, actually asking me this. Yeah. How many times do you get asked that by a James Bond villain? You know, it's, right. <laughs> So, That's yeah, but that, that was what was so much fun also about that particular one, uh, because with Walter and Ian Abercrombie and Sarah Douglas and, of course, the lovely guy, Rolf, who was just the neatest guy. So every single uh, scene, we had some significant actor, including like Conrad Brooks was an extra. And he plays a German soldier and he points up a staircase or something. You know, he was a good friend of David. So he comes down to do it. And I'm like, Conrad Brooks, you know, this is this is so cool. So he'd be there telling me Ed Wood stories and all that. And it was just it was just so much fun. It was just lovely. And again, Guy Rolf was what an incredibly lovely guy. And I'll tell you something. I feel terrible about one thing. Guy Rolf did this really great Hammer War film called Yesterday's Enemy. Val, Val Guest directed it, wrote and directed it. And he is tremendous in this movie. Uh, and I hadn't seen it when I worked with him. So I couldn't sit down and talk to him about it. I so wanted to. and uh, But uh, I, he, he was just such a gentle soul and such a nice man. And that was, uh, and it, it's like, a, it's a privilege when you work with these people who were in the movies that, you know, whether it's, I don't care, it's Mr. Sardonicus or the boys from Brazil or you, you name it. I mean, we had everybody, the seven ups, it didn't matter. You know, it's just like uh, everywhere I turned was somebody who was in another movie I admired. And it sounds like you were able to be present with them and actually talk to them, not in a nuisance way, not in a way that was messing up production, but like you were actually able to spend some time with these guys, share your appreciation, hear some stories. That's really great. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope so. And um, like, you know, Richard Lynch, uh, 
uh, that was kind of a, a bit of a journey to have him finally cast in the movie. But when I saw the film, of course, I was on set with Richard and all that stuff. But then to see in the final result and the way people react to his death, which David pulled off, it was amazing that we are able to do it for not a great deal of money. That scene, I think, is great, where they hoist him to the ceiling and all that stuff, the hooks and everything. And Richard looks like the Blade puppet. He really does. And of course, that's the whole idea, is that he is then going to inhabit that puppet. But he looks like him. Yeah. And so that just that just couldn't have been bettered. Was and, that planned when you cast that role? Did you go, oh, did you do that on purpose? Or was it just, again, no, happy circumstance? No, happy we, David and I had wanted uh, Ralph Bates. And uh, he was uh, very ill with cancer uh, at the time. And in fact, passed away. And we, we were unaware of his illness, but found out about it later. And um, Christopher Neem, the... Uh, really the great app from Dracula AD 72, who's Johnny Alucard, you know, and uh, he living here now, he came in to talk about playing that part. And he even told us, he said, look, Ralph was one of my very best friends. If you cast me, I'm going to donate my salary to his widow, to Virginia Weatherall. And we thought that was so wonderful. And we discussed it with Charlie band and Charlie had to say, no guys, look, you have an entirely European cast. Everybody in this movie is British or German. We have got to have some American actors in this thing or else the foreign distributors will not believe we shot it in the United States. And, you know, that sounds crazy, but unfortunately that is, that is true. That is how things are, are measured and looked at when you get down to the dollars and cents and what, you know, how much people are going to pay for certain titles and all of that stuff. There are all these weird other factors you, you don't think about come into play when the movie's going to be sold. So uh, Charlie, they had just had Richard Lynch in Trancers 2, and he liked him very much. And so Richard ended up in our film and uh, he was terrific. And he, he was a he was a very, very interesting, but very, very nice and very intelligent man. And uh, I was, uh, I'll take years later, we're at a Fangoria convention and, uh, you know, and I'd spent some time with Richard and I'm walking down the thing, looking at all this, you know, the cool stuff I want to buy, you know, and um, Richard Lynch was at a signing table and he said, oh, Courtney, come here, come here. First of all, I was surprised he remembered my name. And I went over there and there was a lady who was buying one of the full size uh, blade uh, figures that, that they used to sell. It was very nice ones. And Richard had signed the box. And he said, you have to have Courtney sign this too, because he wrote the movie. And I did. And she was very nice and very thrilled and everything. But I was astonished after all that time had lapsed. First of all, that Richard remembered me and said, no, he's got to be a part of this too. So that was really cool. That's classy. That's a classy yep. move. Wow. What about uh, Ian Abercrombie, who would, I think a lot of people know him from Seinfeld. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Mr. Pitt. How was he? Mr. Pitt. Yeah. He was, he was such a nice man. And um, interestingly, I remember uh, after the film wrapped and Ian and David got along like a house on fire, they were talking and they mentioned it to me about doing a biography of James Whale. Now, of course, gods and monsters and, you know, whatever kind of, but it was interesting that uh, a couple of very good biographies of James Whale have been published. And so they thought, now, I don't, I don't, I really don't know if Ian was thinking of just being, maybe coming on board as a producer or he was going to play Carl Lemley or something. I don't know. He certainly wouldn't have been uh, physically appropriate for James Whale, but um, he, he was, he was terrific. And, you know, here's the thing. As you know, Heath, and especially when you're doing budgeted movies and you bring in actors who have a name or a reputation or whatever it is, sometimes they're going to be just right there because they look at a job to a job to a job. And I remember once Herbert Lom, who was, oh, I just loved him. But 
we were talking about something and he said the only time he ever got angry at a director was he was getting ready to do a shot and the director said, Herbert, you're being paid a lot of money for this. Do a good job. And he got mad because he thought, now, wait a minute, that is really degrading me as a professional because it doesn't matter the budget. I mean, you know, a guy goes from, you know, Harry Allen Towers to Spartacus and everything in between. So why would somebody make that comment? Because he always brought 100 percent. And that was like the situation on Puppet Master. Every one of these performers brought 100 percent. They didn't think and, you know, it wasn't, you know, super bottom of the barrel. It wasn't Andy Milligan time. Uh, and we're shooting in a studio and all that type of stuff. But um, everybody was dedicated and they they did it. They came and they brought their A game. And I believe and I've been with certain, you know, some actors who, uh, you know, they come on with a chip on their shoulder because they feel put upon that they're doing your million dollar movie for Showtime instead of the $40 million Caraco picture they had done four years before. Well, you know, I mean, I'm kind of starstruck at times, but also too, I have enough wherewithal to say, well, then why the hell did you take the job? Mm -hmm. You know, screw off. That always really bugs me because it's like, look, don't take the job and more specifically take the money and then just come to work expressly to make everybody's life miserable. You, this is early in your, your, uh, your career there at Full Moon. And did this experience influence, you know, you hadn't directed yet, right? You, the transfer Correct. three was still in the future. You're, you're seeing this, you're on set, you're watching all this happen. Did it, uh, was it um, a learning experience for you? Well, you know, um, of course I'd been around uh, Charlie and his dad and all that stuff uh, back in the empire days uh, because of prison. And then I, I was around on a, a couple of projects that didn't get made. So by the time though, a full moon, uh, because the, the VHS boom had just, exploded and money was just raining from the sky so every single studio had their own direct uh, home media division and then there were all these other companies that coming up with you know direct to vhs product and all that stuff so we were all working uh, pretty steadily but the thing was with full moon is at least at, at that time it really was a conveyor belt i mean th those titles were going out to Blockbuster and Hollywood Video and all those places. So there was um, really a formula that had been laid out. Uh, I remember when we were shooting Dr. Mordred, which was the first one in this group of three, uh, Albert Band and Charlie both made sure that I got to know the entire crew because I was going to be inheriting those guys when, when I did Trancers 3. And uh, Albert even let me do some camera setups. So I would get, you know, at least somewhat comfortable with Adolfo Bartoli and he wouldn't be a, a total stranger to me and all this uh, type of stuff. So the uh, informing the way I was going to direct uh, transfers, absolutely only because David knew uh, how to operate within that framework. You know, he was the old hand and he's not that old. In fact, I think he's younger than I am. And um uh, so the way he organized his shows, the way he organized his days and what have you. So, and uh, I would say this though, from uh, uh, a camera setup point of view, and of course the Adolfo was so terrific to work with. Um, I also took a few pages from watching Virgil Vogel direct TV all those years when I was working with him. So, uh, and in fact, I have one, what I call my Virgil Vogel shot where it was like, four pages done in one thing as we kind of move around the room and push in and push out and push in and push out. So I was like, yes, this is just like, you know, Virgil do on the streets of San Francisco or something. You know? All these years later, this is my final question. How do you feel about the film? What the legacy of the film? When you think about Puppet Master 3, what comes to mind? The thing was with Puppet Master 3, when we were making it, everybody was excited about it because it seemed to be, it was turning out well. And you can sense that. And um, I remember one, the, the day we did uh, Walter Gotell's death scene and Chuck Borden leaps out of the window and does that high fall. 
oh my gosh, everybody was so excited about that because it was a stunt. I mean, it was a real stunt, mm -hmm. which traditionally on a low budget movie like this, you didn't get a great deal of that that stuff. We weren't flipping old cars and th that type of thing. This is somebody in costume and it's a period thing and you know, all that stuff. And so um, for me, I mean, I know all of the that emotion and enthusiasm had an impact on the final product and the final product has sustained which really is kind of amazing to me not because i dismissed the movie but because it's it's so much fun that everybody else you know seems to enjoy it and and endorses it so um and now that it's in this uh format it really means it's going to be kind of preserved forever you know so i'm i'm very happy about that it's beautiful. 4K is the close, you know, I talk to so many people that make movies. They love their work on 4K because it's as close as you can get to that 35 millimeter presentation. And this really does look like that. I mean, you know, the, the shot on film, it, it just translates so well. And yeah, as you say, 4K is also an opportunity. For, there are a lot of people that really come to movies because of 4K. So there's going to be a lot of people seeing this for the first time because of uh, this format. And if maybe if they haven't seen the first two movies, I say, don't worry about it. This is a prequel. You can just jump right into it and you catch up from there. Um, but this is available now and it has a commentary. People, if people watch this and they're like, well, I want to spend more time with this guy. So you and the director, David Dakota have a commentary here and it's wonderful. There's a lot of special features here. You get to watch the movie with you guys. And it's an informative. There's like, this is a one -er. Okay. And they're like the teaching the craft. Oh, yeah. Right. So um, it's loaded. So I don't know. I love it. I highly recommend it. And I really appreciate you being here to talk to me about it. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. He very much. Oh, and one thing I think that's on there that's really neat is the uh, original video zone that was done. Yep. All that behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything else that you, while you're here, is there anything else you want to tell people? Any, any projects you want to pitch or promote? Um, well, let's see for the, just the commentary stuff coming up. Um, uh, we just had a very nice uh, re-release from indicator of the big gun down with Lee Van Cleef. And Henry Park and I did that commentary years ago, but they ported it over. We actually did it for Bob Murawski uh, and Grindhouse, and they ported it over. And now upcoming, I think uh, next week or the week after is uh, Death of a Gunfighter with Richard Widmark, which is the first Alan Smithy film. It was actually directed by Don Siegel and Robert Totten. And also, let's see. There is a collection called Thrillers from the Vault that is coming out from Mill Creek and where I am pleased to say I share the microphone with this incredibly knowledgeable, awesome guy currently wearing a Monogram Pictures t-shirt. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. And we did uh, The Man They Could Not Hang together. That was so much fun. Thank you for inviting me to do that too. Oh, man. Well, no, it just turned out really well. And um, what I like about when we did that is, like you said, with Puppet Master 3 or whatever it is, it's reintroducing these movies to people who may not have ever seen them before. And we make the real you know, parallels between that movie and Saw and all these other things that have come mm -hmm. since then. And they're just right there as you watch the film. Yeah. And yeah. this kind of shocking brutality and all that stuff. And so that was a, and that's turned out to be a really nice, uh, Really nice set. Uh, Dr. Steve Haberman is on there and uh, uh, all the guys from Monster Party. And we have, I think, six movies, correct? Uh, eight on the three. Oh, eight movies. Excuse yeah. me. Yes. And yeah. um, so it's, uh, it's a very nice set. And I'm really pleased. Anytime I get a chance to get on and yak about uh, old horror movies, and there's a little featurette on there and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, that's great fun. So those that's a media and also sci-fi from the vault from uh, are also from our good friends at uh, Mill Creek Entertainment. So. Yeah. People have told me, so I talked about a little bit on a, a video on my channel. People are like, well, I'm going to pick that release up for you, but I've never seen any of the movies. And I'm just thinking like, well, you are in for a treat because you're about to see eight. If you buy both of them, I mean, that's a dozen classic Columbia, you know, really fun sci-fi genre horror movies and you can't yeah. go wrong I mean, this stuff's golden including two on sci-fi two ray harryhausen's 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and also, although we have the, the Karloffs, we also have Bella Lugosi in Return of the Vampire. Absolutely. Great yep. stuff. I mean, this is the stuff that we love. This is those are the kinds of movies that I named when I when I named my channel and my my platform Serial at Midnight. That's the movies I was watching in my head when I named it Serial at Midnight. Like I'm watching these while I eat Serial at Midnight. Karloff, Bella Lugosi. That's what it, it all ties together. Thank you, my friend. The C Thank stands you. for classy. Classy Courtney Joyner. That's also your okay. wrestling name. But <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. This was great. Uh, and we'll put a pin in this one until next time. Guys, join in the uh, join in the comments below. I'll put a link to where you can buy Puppet Master 3. I'll put a link to where you can find Mr. Joiner. And uh, until next time, we will catch you later.